Steve, do you want to take one more coral question for our watch? We have a viewer who's very yeah. curious about um, the naming of clades. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the S1 clade and an S clade, mm -hmm. and wondering why we've been dropped, why those numbers have been dropped. Yeah. Um, so the, each clade can have different numbers associated with it, but generally S clade are more similar. Uh, within S clade, there might be you know subgroupings, so S1, um, others. Um, I know not not every clade has multiple numbers, but for example, I clade, uh, which actually co kind of corresponds to the genus Isodella, um, has I1 and I4 groupings. Um, so that's where that comes from. It's kind of human generated uh, based on scientists who have studied it for a very long time. Gotcha, mm -hmm. thanks. All right, we are about to make a watch change. Um, so bear with us. We may have a little bit of quiet time as we get our next watch caught up. Thanks all for listening in on our watch and we look forward to uh, diving with you later.
I just changed it on. Oh. Just getting settled here on the Team Blue Water. So give us a moment to start doing introductions for the watch. You're very quiet. <laughs> Am I now less quiet? Yep. Okay. I moved it by about a millimeter. Hi, everybody. Hello, Hi. 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 Hey. Hello. Hello hey there. there. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Who's there? <laughs> oh, it's all of us. <laughs> it's blue the water front watch. water, blue water watch. <laughs> front water, front. Front water, front blue water. watch. <laughs> I don't know. Here we are again. Oh, wow. Oh, no. Who has a good story? What's a good story? Somebody tell a good story. Oh, I don't have any good stories. You must have something. No. I'm going to tell a little story about mapping gaps to Seamount G. Oh, should I put your maps up? Oh, no, because i got to get it ready first. Okay, well, give me a heads up when not it's ready. Yeah, if you want to watch all the painful details of getting stuff in high pack, but that's not that exciting. I guess the world could be watching that anyway, depending on what you have. It. Hello. If I put that there, can I use this for something else for a little bit? You're cool? Okay.
Yeah, they do both move it, and I, I could, like, cross my... It's crazy. It's nuts. Oh, <laughs> if I could only, like, mouse with both hands, it'd be great. All right, well, welcome to the Blue Water Watch. We took you down, now we're taking you back up to the surface. But we now have lots of samples to process when we get to the surface, so that's really exciting. It's always fun to come back onto deck and uh, get everything processed. So this is uh, Expedition NA-135, dive 1898, on Seamount C, on an unnamed seamount in a chain of seamounts located just south of the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. That makes up the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. My name is Megan Putz. I'm from the University of Hawaii, and I am your watch lead for today. And the rest of us here in the back row, I have to my right. Hi, this is Coralie Rodriguez. Uh, I am the data logger. To my left. I'm Abrian Carrington. I am a professional illustrator and your science communication fellow on this watch. And then our front row, we have our amazing ROV team and video team. I'm Trevor. I'm in the Herc seat. Antonella sitting in the Argus seat. I'm Erin Rainey in the video engineer seat. And Erin Heffron in the navigation seat. So welcome everyone to the last few minutes of this dive. We are currently at 1,499 meters and ascending. So we will be here for not too much longer. Uh, two hours. Yeah, two hours. I'm, I'm just trying to stay positive, guys. <laughs> Positivity. We're just staying real. <laughs> hey, remember in geologic time, that's a blink of the eye. That's right. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot that uh, we actually ascend slower than we descend. And for those asking, yes, uh, the dive is predicted to be 4 a.m. Hawaiian Standard Time, not Pacific. It's an early dive. And we'll be here with you again. <laughs> Blue Water Watch. And you mentioned that we ascend slower than we descend. At what rate are we ascending? Uh, what are we at? Uh, is it 14 now? What we're our ascent rate right now? We'll be on deck at 6. They just asked for the rate of ascent. Oh, I don't know. 15 meters a minute-ish? It's kind of bouncy. I'm going up between 12 and 22. 15? I don't know. 15 is what we estimate, and then it kind of bounces around. What stops you from pulling them up, you know, as fast as you possibly can? Like, this is, is as safety? fast as we possibly can. <laughs> I mean, but I'm what? hundred percent up. Well, ninety nine. What controls up. that? Let's say it that way. What's that? What controls that? Let's say it that way. Is it you know winch speed? Is it the thruster? It's it's Herc's max rate of ascent. So, I got the two vertical thrusters. You can see it when it's on deck. They're tucked into the side of the yellow foam block. Um, and directly underneath that is the starboard bio box, the starboard sample box. And on the other side, it's a bunch of Niskins. So when you're going down, the thrusters push water out the top of the vehicle, which works really well. We can go down really fast. Coming up, you're actually pushing water down, but it hits that box, hits the Niskins, and it hits all the vehicle parts. So it's like trying to push a sailboat by standing in the back and using a fan doesn't really work so well. So we're a lot slower coming up for that reason. Thoroughly, it looks like somebody is manifesting a big squid or giant jelly to come by in the next hour. So that's your manifestation again. Same. I'm always hopping, 
hoping for an octopus, but I don't think we'll see one. Positive, positive thought. <laughs> I'm just trying to be real. I was told to be more real. <laughs> Well, how about you imagine a very colorful deep sea animal and explain for us why deep sea creatures might have a lot of color, even though there's not a lot of light down there. So one of the main colors that you might see these animals be is bright red, which to us is just a I, big oh, signaling sort of color uh, on the surface. Yes. Anything colored red is just calling for attention. Eat me. But... Uh, here in the deep ocean, red is the first color to attenuate in the in the sea. So red actually looks black. It blends in a lot better than any other color. So being a bright red color is actually advantageous. You'll notice that uh, different animals will use this color in different ways. Some animals might be translucent, but just have red around their stomachs. And that can be really helpful if you're an animal that likes to eat things that bioluminesce, you eat something that glows, you don't want to draw attention to yourself because what your last meal was is now just glowing inside your tummy. So it's good to camouflage those sorts of things. A lot of the animals that we might see in the water column as we're ascending uh, will likely be translucent. You might see some siphonophores, maybe some polychaetes, um, some jellies, small jellies. And being translucent makes you less easy to spot. Other animals that have bioluminescence can use that bioluminescence to counteract the light and sort of blend in by mimicking the blue light that's coming from the surface. Yeah, squids utilize that feature when they're like higher up in the water. Am I crazy? Yeah, uh, lantern fishes and um, other fishes uh, might also be silver in nature to reflect light. And that helps them sort of blend in. You'll notice that a lot of animals will have these, you know, contrasting colors. Uh, dolphins, for example, are gray on top and have white stomachs, so that makes them harder to spot against, you know, looking down in the ocean where the gray is going to help them blend, and then looking up, the white's going to help them blend from the light coming down from the, the surface of the ocean. You'll notice a lot of animals have that type of co coloration. It's all about uh, not being seen by the things that want to eat you, and being able to spot the things you want to eat. Speaking of thriving in the low light, is there a specific O2 concentration uh, below the light zone that holds the most life? What was that? Is there a specific O2 concentration be below the light zone that holds the most life? I don't think the oxygen concentration affects the light transmission through water. So our, our current depth, there is absolutely no light down here. Oh, I think they were just asking like a specific oxygen concentration that's best for thriving without the influence of light. Um, well, higher oxygen concentrations are better. Um, Oxygen minimum zones uh, are found throughout the ocean, and there are some oxygen minimum zones are just so low that are it's hard for animals to thrive. Uh, it doesn't mean there isn't any life there. It just means that the life that is there is very specifically adapted to life in low oxygen environments.
So if you're looking at the oxygen graph right now, you notice that it's actually decreasing currently. So we're approaching probably that the oxygen minimum zone. So you'll be able to see these profiles as we ascend. And then as we ascend, you'll also notice that the temperature is now increasing quite a bit. Were we pulling up a map of the seamount earlier? What we were working on? What, what did you say? Were we uh, pulling up a map of the seamount earlier? I was trying to uh, update statuses. I was just catching the the end of that conversation. Yeah, I think she's just getting the map ready so we can talk about it. No, can't say that I do. Oh. Is Adam here to tell us his promised stories? Yeah, Adam Sewell, everyone. Woohoo! Story time. Yeah, story time. Welcome to the program. Welcome to Blue Water Watch 2021. <laughs> You're here with the, the Blue Water Professionals. Well, as our storyteller of the evening gets set up, uh, maybe somebody can answer how the light from the ROVs affect the animals that have never been exposed to light. Um, well, some of these animals, you do notice, uh, actually avert their eyes from uh, the ROV. Sometimes you see those uh, cutthroat eels. They'll shake their heads and swim backwards when they get blinded by the light. So um, you do see some behavioral reactions to the light of the ROV. But we don't have any reason to believe that this light is harming them in any way. It's sort of like uh, if someone shines a flashlight in your eyes, yeah, for a few minutes, you, you might be a little stunned. But after a while, your eyes will go back to normal. So um, we don't have any reason to believe that the light is negatively impacting them, except for the moment in which they are startled. Uh, a lot of these animals actually don't see light or can only detect the presence or absence of light. So they're not going to be as impacted as, say, we would when uh, a flashlight is shining in our eyes. We bring the light with us because that's what we need in order to understand what the environment is like. You know, I wonder if they go back home and tell, like, alien abduction-like level stories, and you know, their fish friends are like, we don't believe that nonsense. Right? That's what, what I always light. think about. But is there, isn't there some examples of shrimp that uh, can be damaged by the lights? I know that for a while people were approaching some hydrothermal vents in the middle Atlantic Ridge with red lights in order to not harm the, the shrimp, but I don't know if that was anecdotal or uh, real evidence. Um, I'm not sure about, like, long-term harm but if they were trying to study the shrimp behavior mm -hmm. approaching with white light could affect the way they're interacting with their environment and uh that that could be a reason why they were trying to use red light because a lot of animals can't see red light in the deep sea but we have found that our there are a few animals out there that actually produce red light in the form of bioluminescence which is really strange because mm -hmm. who sees red light that's the first light to, to lose transmission through the water. So um, there must be some animals out there that can detect that red light. Otherwise, why would you have that adaptation? It'd be a pretty fancy adaptation if 
the mate that you're looking for could detect it, but no one else could, that would be a great uh, advantage, you know? Exactly. That way, you know, you're signaling for a mate, but no one else knows that you're having this private conversation. Other animals that do use bioluminescence for mate signaling could also be drawing attention to themselves by, you know, giving off blue or green light. Right. Video, Aaron. How would that affect, um, like, color correction and whatnot using a red light? Would that look any different to us, or, like, how would that go? If we used red light? Mm -hmm. Yes, it would look very different. Um, y yeah, <laughs> it would just look really different. We did have one time where we brought a low-light like, camera to try to look at bioluminescence, so we did have the lights off quite a bit more, um, which is quite cool. You could see little streaks of bioluminescence, but I haven't been on one where we've used a red light yet. So we know that uh, Herc uses thrusters to get up. Um, how is Argus getting off the seafloor? How does that process work? That's kind of like uh, when your dog is way out in front of you on the leash and you start pulling back. I don't think Argus thrusts up at all. I think it gets pulled entirely by the, by the cable. I don't know, Argus pilot. What have you got uh, for us? That is correct. Argus is on the winch and being winched up. Um, the only thrusters on Argus are lateral ones, um, so we can change the heading, um, and in rare situations, lateral to one side or the other. But yeah, the, all the vertical um, positioning of Argus is controlled by the winch. Oh, we've got a question about the, uh, the triangle at the top of the screen. Those are... Uh, Lasers, they're spaced ten centimeters apart, and the reason why they're making it, oh, we just put the way. the reason why they're making a triangle is that they're not focused on anything. I mean, there's nothing in front of them to stop them from just shooting off into eternity. So, um, if there was, you know, if suddenly uh, an organism came right in front of them, you would see them the two individual dots on the organism. It's a great example of perspective, right? Those those lasers are perfectly parallel to each other. Uh, but as they get further in the distance, it, it looks like they get closer and closer. Indeed, this would be one point perspective. Just like railroad tracks. Exactly. Yeah. And they'll never touch. They'll never t I thought you were never going to touch the railroad tracks. I was like, it's okay. That's, a good, that's a good, no, that's a good rule to live by. You don't want to get hit by a train. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but you really do want to squish a penny once that's in your true. life, yeah. you know? Yeah, but they got machines for that nowadays. Yeah. You can get you know, printed with all sorts of cool things. Uh, They're so expensive. It's like, a dollar. it's like a whole dollar for a penny. Viewers, yeah, but please. you can do it on the train tracks for free, and what do you have to lose? It's a finger. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone watching this dive, please pay the $2 to crush your penny in a machine and do not use the railroad tracks. I don't know. Live a little. Bad idea. <laughs> Bad idea. Ooh, have we found any natural blue animals or organisms um, under the sea? Blue? Yes. Yeah, man. Uh, some, I think it was on, it was with Nautilus when I saw these fantastic blue ciliates. Um, they, it looked like a blue shag carpet, and they were concentrated on... Uh, extinct hydrothermal vents, so hydrothermal vents that, that weren't active anymore, and uh, quite possibly the most beautiful thing I've, I've seen on the ocean floor. That was when we were in Mexico, right? Yeah, that's right. You guys went to Mexico together? Yeah. It was, well, we also were I think I was on an too. expedition. Yeah. yeah. We just all went on vacation. In Mexico. fact, the cool, one of the strangest things, Trevor might have already been on the ship, but we stayed in this uh, resort kind of place in La Paz before getting on the ship, and there was like a show. It was like an all-inclusive resort, and it was a Michael Jackson Oh, that was impersonator. amazing. It was unbelievable. How come I haven't heard about this Holy <laughs> <until now>. cow. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. It was... 
It was really, really well good. Done. It was really yeah. well done. That's nuts. That was my first cruise. I was an intern that year. <laughs> You're like, wow. I was like, what have great. I gotten like, into? Do we get Michael Jackson impersonators every cruise? <laughs> <laughs> and like, the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that should totally be a thing. As an intern, did you take a bootleg video of the impersonator? <laughs> I would never. <laughs> of course, of course. I have I'll ask video. you unofficially later. <laughs> What other blue things do we see on the, the seafloor? We had some really pretty blue corals. Steve was here, he could tell us about it. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> um, like we Samoa. do see plexorid corals that, was that are the, blue. That walls, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were yeah, really was... pretty, like ultra -violet. Where was that? Yeah. It was one of the really big transit map, transit map, yeah. dive map, transit things. One of those. Trevor, help me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, where we dove and then we mapped. And we then coconuts were in there somewhere. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That coconuts, one. yeah. That's very descriptive. Yep. Probably in the Pacific Ocean, I think. It was probably in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> You're probably right. It's yes, we do coconut. have those blue plexorids here in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we'd see them at shallower depths, probably around 700 meters. Maybe right. a little bit shallower. We're super pretty. Super pretty. Yeah, they are really cool, and, and no one's really described them either. Uh, a few samples have been collected, and they're waiting for a taxonomist out there to describe them. And I really want that to happen because I want to add that to our animal guide. Uh, we do have, do have pictures in the animal guide uh, of these blue plexorid corals, but they're just called plexorid blue. I'm thinking maybe a taxonomist match.com kind of situation right you put up your unidentified animal taxonomist like come and your your new mate your soul mate your yeah. research mate <laughs> get to know each other really well <laughs> megan you have a long time fan in the chat who says you are a genius oh thank you thanks mom <laughs> it could be no. my mom. Uh, well, unless your mom's name is Jason. No, no. <laughs> Ew, I don't know if anybody's a, a laser expert. Someone is wondering why we can see the laser, like the length of the laser, when on you know on land we wouldn't usually be able to see an actual laser. It's all the bits in the water. The water's not, you can see the big chunky bits, which is the marine snow, but uh, there's even just small stuff all the way. Same as when you can see it in a foggy day. The fog is little bits of moisture, which reflect back the light to, you know, the car headlights or whatever. Kind of similar with the lasers, just some stuff in the water everywhere. Or the water itself just reflects the light back. Yeah, last time I checked, the water was fairly moist. Water's pretty pretty damp, yeah. One thing that uh, technology that's kind of reaching maturity now is using laser light underwater to, for communications. So uh, most commonly, when, when you're not connected via cable, uh, you use acoustics or, or sound to send data through the water. Um, and you can send, send data a, a pretty long way with that method, but the bandwidth is very low. With the laser, uh, kind of pulsed laser, you can send a lot more information, uh, but you can't send it quite as far. But you know the effect you're seeing here of, of it scattering off the, the bits in the water actually helps it go a bit further. Uh, so I, I don't think it'll be that long till it's you know kind of a standard method for short distance underwater communications. That's really cool. We, we were using that technology uh, about three, three or four cruises ago. Yeah, that was the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute uh, technology demonstration cruise. Mm -hmm. Were you talking with the animals using lasers? Mm. It might be a way to communicate. Have you guys heard that that woman who like records uh, dolphin vocalizations and and is trying to like decode their language? Mm -hmm. uh, 
I could do without understanding what Dolphins are saying. I'd rather chat with them. I mean, it's not not since Flipper have we been able to communicate <laughs> with uh, sea creatures. That's true. So are we doing, is it like a Morse code situation? With the no, lizards? it's like a, it's like a, like when you go to another country where you don't speak the language and you hear some sounds or words over and over, she's using it that way, like. Oh, no, I meant with the lasers. Oh, with the lasers? Yeah, yeah. What, what about them? Sorry, I missed the question. Communication there. between, you know, uh, and two, two vehicles entities underwater, yeah. Yeah, two, so like, for example, if you had a autonomous underwater vehicle robot that was going out and mapping, and you wanted to use that map to decide where to go next with the ROV, you could uh, have the vehicle come close enough and send the whole map over to uh, to the ROV and, and use it that way. Um, or you could put one of these devices on something that you wanted to leave on the seafloor for a long time, like a seismometer or a lander, and drive up to it. And instead of having to uh, plug things in to, to get the data, you could just be near enough that you could use that to, to communicate the you know, the kind of possibilities are endless. Uh, we, we take for granted how easy it is to communicate through air. Um, and in the water, it's so much harder. And, and it makes uh, kind of coordinating multiple robots a, a much more difficult task. I remember so, when Bluetooth, oh, go ahead. Oh, how close do the vehicles need to be in order to communicate with each other? Uh, it really depends on the the system right now it's not super standardized so um i think on the trevor can say what kind of distances they were getting on that last cruise but it was kind of 50 meters or so was uh you know the end of the range but uh there are systems that that at least uh under ideal conditions can reach 150 meters okay. i'm not sure what they were getting last cruise i wasn't actually on the cruise uh, so. oh here's an, another cool use for it so say you had, uh, instead of uh, uh, the tether between Herc and, and Argus, say you had uh, an optical comms device. And so the notion of you know, getting pulled around by, by Argus could be a thing of the past. You have this kind of uh, virtual tether between them for communications, but more freedom of movement of the ROV. Like underwater Bluetooth, kind of. Underwater what? Bluetooth. Yeah, exactly. I remember when Bluetooth came on the scene. What is this dark magic? <laughs> Question for Genius Megan. When annotating dive videos, do you also watch or monitor blue water? So no, I don't watch the blue water. I basically just cut that out of the video uh, and just watch the bottom time. That sounds like cheating to me. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's paying for it now. <laughs> They're but like, let's purposely put her on the watch with all the blue water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you guys are torturing me. <laughs> See how it is. They're like, they heard I, I participated in a couple mid-water dives, and now here I am watching Ace and Descents. <laughs> but even though Megan takes, takes it out of what she looks at, she doesn't throw it away. So anyone who wants to look at the blue water, um, you know, there's an opportunity to do a bunch of annotation and help out science. I mean, it's a, it's the kind of the huge volume of the ocean is, is in between the seafloor and the top, and, and there's a, a ton to explore in there. Exactly. Um, there, there's a lot of data here in these, these basically transects that we're making through the water. And uh, there are some groups out there that are actually annotating uh, mid-water dives and, and looking at the jellies in particular. Uh, we look at the jellies mainly using our OVs because it's really hard to collect them. Uh, they're so fragile. And they also don't avoid the ROV because they aren't very strong swimmers. So it's easy to survey um, jellies using an ROV, where it might be more difficult to survey more mobile creatures like fish. So in order to sample, um, say, a fish in the, in the water column, you can use other um, 
methods like a mock nest tow in order to collect those specimens. But jellies would just get torn up. But if you really wanted to explore the midwater, you probably wouldn't do it by going on a straight line through it. Because there's lots of ways you can tell where stuff's kind of hanging out in, in the midwater. You can use acoustics and, and the sound bounces off of it and you see scattering layers. And the smart thing to do would be to go to those and, and, and focus your attention there. Because you could look at a transect like this and, and probably the reason Megan wouldn't do it is, you know, it's one second for every hour that something of interest might show up, you know. And uh, so the tools that kind of hang out in the midwater and focused uh, exploration of the midwater is probably where we need to start to get the most bang for our buck. Exactly. So for doing a, a midwater survey, it would be best to uh, put the vehicles in an orientation where Hercules is in front and always moving ahead. That way we're not disturbing things by the wire in Argus, uh, disturbing the water in front of us. And then you want to be sort of looking up into the water column so that the water is actually moving toward the camera, bringing the things we're interested in viewing straight to us and so us having to go to them. That way we have time to do some zooms um, because everything's moving. It's not like when we're, we can't settle down on the bottom mm -hmm. to look at these animals. It, everything has to be done on the fly. So it really is a unique challenge to survey animals in the water column. Yeah, the uh, Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute that I mentioned, one of the tools that we're developing is a robot called Mesobot. Uh, it's developed by Dana Yorger at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And it's a, a robot designed to, to be in the midwater and not only, uh, as, as Megan said, kind of move through it and see what's coming towards it, but to uh, visually lock on to an animal and... Uh, you know, follow that animal around. So uh, in addition to simply surveying what's there, start to, to explore the behaviors of the, the animals in the midwater. Yeah, that was a really cool demonstration that you guys had earlier this year. Oh, there's a jelly. Oh, look at it go. A little red jelly floating away from us. Bye. What's the coolest thing you've seen on a going through the, the midwater? Sharks. I love when the sharks come visit us. I saw a sailfish once. Oh, in, that's cool. When I was in a submarine, like the kind with the acrylic dome and that. Oh, and also on that same cruise, there were sea turtles. One of them landed and sat right on top of the, the <laughs> sub and rode it up for a while. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I had a question about what the seafloor looks like at higher latitudes. Honestly, the seafloor changes from within the same latitude. You can go 100 meters and the seafloor is going to look different. Can I talk about that? Yeah, that's right. It's not necessarily latitude dependent, but kind of the tectonic environment that you're in. You know, it, across all the latitudes, you can find mid-ocean ridges that are, you know, very active volcanic features. You can find subduction zones at all latitudes that uh, are these kind of deep uh, trenches where there's sediment sliding down and, uh, you know, and uh, you know, really cool organisms adapted to, to ultra-deep conditions. <clears throat> Out here in the where we are, you know, you can go one direction and find a abyssal seafloor that is <clears throat> would look pretty monotonous to us, just sedimented, flat seafloor, and then a, a seamount pops up from that and looks uh, completely different. So, yeah, I agree. It's, you know, there's a huge variety uh, wherever you are in the ocean. I did not uh, know what monotonous meant until I saw, uh, we did some surveying of a continental shelf and it was very flat. <laughs> mm -hmm. I looked on the map, I was like, it's gonna be kind of flat, but no, the map did not lie. <laughs> it was flat. Yeah, you haven't seen flats until you, you've seen the abyssal plains. Mm -hmm. 
They are quite fat. And then people who study them get really excited when there's a hill. <laughs> They'll have like a rise of like a couple meters over like a length of a kilometer. And they're like, oh, wow, we're up so high. <laughs> So everything is relative. Oh, there's a nice little squishy guy. Yeah. There he goes. Do they ever do deep drop fishing to sample midwater? Deep. Midwater samples. Midwater sampling. By by fishing? We do uh, midwater niskin samples sometimes at various depths during an ascent or a descent. That counts. Yep. That counts. I validate that. It could be possible to use a suction sampler on the fly, but uh, we would have to stop our ascent and be really, really lucky. It's it's a real challenge to try to suction something in through the middle water. In general, we're we're not going to be collecting any samples uh, during this expedition in the midwater as we make our way to the seafloor or up from it. But never say never. What if there's something amazing that we can't just resist making collection of a vampire we, squid? I don't know if we'll be able to catch that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'd probably take one look because I nah, no, mm -hmm. they're too smart for us. Mm -hmm. Kind of a question for one of our engineers, but um, what do we do about fresh water when we're out at sea? We have a desalination system. What do we do? Are you talking about fresh water that um, we're using for our showers and drinking? Well, you guys are taking showers? Just <laughs> I know you said you limit yourself <laughs> to like two to three, but you know, we have standards. Yeah, how do we make fresh water on this ship? I don't, actually have never seen the system that makes fresh water. Is it evaporative or reverse I osmosis? I believe it's reverse osmosis. Um, I'm not sure about this ship because uh, I haven't asked an engineer yet. This is my first time on the Nautilus. Hmm. But on other ships that I've been on, they have reverse osmosis. Most ships that I've been on, they're able to make plenty of water when they're underway, uh, but not when they get to port, either because the engines aren't running or you don't want to suck in that harbor water to, to make fresh water. Yep. Um, but, I mean, the, the bottom line from our perspective is probably that there's plenty of water. We're, we're, we don't run short, and we can shower and cook and drink, and that's great. We have two different types of water on Nautilus too. We got drinking water and other fresh water. So like washing the deck down and flushing the toilets is done with other water. But the water you drink in the galley and all the stuff they make the food with is all specific drinking water. And Nautilus has the capability to make fresh water, but I don't know that it's necessarily drinking grade. So it goes and fills the other auxiliary tanks. And we have lots and lots of drinking water that lasts us for weeks at sea. I've also got a fancy little spigot for um, osmosis water, which I use regularly. I think that's a reverse osmosis thing yeah. after it's already drinking water. So reverse osmosis is, is the drinking water. Osmosis sizes, I believe, is the proper term. I prefer, <laughs> I don't know if you guys like this, but forward osmosis water, a bit tangier. What's that? Forward osmosis? You don't For drink that? Forward osmosis, yeah. yeah. That's the other side. That's what they drink in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone ever seen a giant octopus? Giant octopus, do you and say? As in a giant squid or an actual giant octopus? A giant Pacific like? octopus. We see those all the time off the coast of British Columbia and uh, Washington and stuff. Yep. I say all the time, but, you know, semi-frequently. Um, I live right beside a nice pod of them in uh, Washington State, but 
I have not gone down to look at them. They're very friendly, I hear, and they like to play with divers, and they like to hug them, Whoa. take off their masks, and have fun. <laughs> not so fun for the diver, though. Just a, you know, a typical good time, taking your mask off. That's a murder octopus. <laughs> octopus. Playful murder. They're just Cutest very murder curious. ever. Just having a good time. You know, if they mean well, is it murder? <laughs> That's for the trial to decide. Oh, the uh, freshwater question um, was actually about the ROVs. Um, do you have fresh water to prevent rust from washing the ROVs? Yeah. we Same water they wash the deck down with, we wash the ROVs down with every dive. So rinse all the salt water off, inhibits corrosion. It wouldn't be rust. There's no steel on the ROVs, but we uh, rinse all the salt water off to prevent corrosion and oxidation on the aluminum. What other methods do you have to reduce corrosion? We have zincs on Argus, which is, well, zinc, metal, uh, bolted to the aluminum frame. And that uses some magic of science to corrode those sacrificial zincs before it corrodes the frame. It's an anode-cathode relationship, and zincs are called a sacrificial anode. We also have sacrificial anodes on Argus as well. They're, they actually are steel because Argus's frame is stainless steel. So you have to pick your sacrificial anode to be the correct material or the material you're trying to protect. All right, Adam, you want to talk possibilities, mapping? You're being called back. Yep. Can you see high pack? Oh, I could have talked to you back there, too. <laughs> ah, OK. Looks like we are in the triple digits of meters. We're finally up to about 945 meters. Great. Yep, we're getting there. Slowly but surely. Oh, yeah, that looks like a piece of a siphonophore. Uh, sometimes they start to break apart when disturbed by the thrusters. Did they ever get put back together? What was that? So did they ever get put back together? Oh, no, but um, they, they might, you know, end up making their own new colonies after being broken apart. Just thinking about like otters rafting, holding hands. Holding and, hands like, and separated. then coming back together. Yeah, I feel like that would be really hard since uh, they can't actively really swim strongly towards each other after getting split apart. They sort of drift away. That's true. The siphonophores are a colonial organism where each individual actually has its own specific job uh, that only it can do. So you'll have animals that are, are for swimming, you'll have animals that are for feeding, and they work together um, as a whole organism. They're never alone. Never alone, always together. Except when, you know, they go next to a thruster. They're very, very fragile. Just like the lightest little current will make them separate.
How many people crew the ship generally? There's the core crew that actually run the ship, and then there's the science party. We've got like, what's that, like 15 ish on the crew, and then 30 ish on the science team this time? That sounds about right. Yeah. I think we can hold, what do you say, 52 people altogether? Yeah, that's the max capacity of the ship. Right. And no more than 52 at any given time. <laughs> 